Okay. Hello, everyone. We're officially live. Thank you so much for joining us today for our panel on how consumer brands are making NFTs. And before we dive into things, I would love it if each of my amazing panelists could go around one by one and maybe tell me a bit about your background in the space, some interesting projects that you might be working on, and uh, something to see in the future. So, starting with Sean, if you want to kick us off. Cool. Hey, how's it going, everybody? My name is Sean Nasiri. Uh, I run Venture for a family office out of the UAE, uh, which is actually becoming uh, quite the, the crypto hub these days. Uh, prior to joining uh, JS Ventures, um, I've been in blockchain the last five years. I was previously with Tokensoft. Um, we did um, most of like the multi-jurisdictional institutional raises such as Hashgraph, Handshake, Keep Network, uh, Seba, INX, uh, to name a few. Uh, then I joined an investment bank in the space that was more focused on uh, tokenized securities, digital assets. Uh, so I guess I've always sort of been on the institutional side of um, the blockchain game. And uh, we're really excited about what's happening with, with Web3, uh, specifically within NFTs and all the implications that it can make. Amazing. Thank you. And as someone in our chat asked that you guys drop your contact link. So I definitely recommend doing so either, you know, during the discussion or afterwards if you don't have the chance. Um, but how about you, Rebecca, if you could tell us a bit about your background, some of the things you're working on currently. Sure. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my background has really all been about connecting brands and consumers. Um, the way they've connected has evolved over the last 12 years. 12, 15 years, um, I've been involved in a lot of the next thing, like, and been involved in shepherding the brands into the next thing. So that's a lot of like innovation, emerging technologies. So um, Web3 was kind of just a natural step forward for me um, as I continued just that pattern of like, how do we evolve the brand consumer relationship? Um, I worked at agencies for a number of years. I was consulting for eight years. Um, I have an advanced law degree in IP law, which is all about NFTs. Uh, so very, very important um, as we discuss NFTs. And now the last two years I've been involved in Web3 native projects, um, creating strategy, launch, uh, how do we build this from the ground up, um, as well as more recently, the Web2 to Web3 transition, working with brands that are like, hey, we want to be involved in this, but we don't know how, help us. Um, I'm an advisor for a few Web3 uh, native companies, and I run a portfolio of Web three projects, so kind of I'm kind of involved in a lot of different things, but the NFT aspect of all the Web three pillars is personally my favorite. So we'll get into that. Amazing, very excited to. And how about you, Noel? Some background and projects that you're currently working on in the space. Yep. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me, Tally and team. Um, so my background was startups, and um, a little bit similar to Rebecca. Um, always within an emerging space. So right just as the consumer taste was about to change, sometimes a little too early, <laughs> which comes with its own pain points. Um, and I uh, um, really felt the energy within the last kind of year um, in the in the Web3 space and have uh, recently transitioned out of agency where I've been for the last five and a half years um, in a uh, global head of digital role um, two different agencies into now uh, Web3. So um, for me, that mostly looks like NFTs at the moment. Um, I'm actually finishing a, a course on uh, blockchain strategy at Oxford University. So um, uh, uh, that's been great. It's been touching on sort of like we're talking about IP, cryptos, you know, the DeFi applications um, uh, uh, and applying uh, that in some real time with um, NFT projects with uh, with with different clients. So um, one project I was a part of um, that's just recently minted Albright. Um, that's a, a network of female professionals who um, are uh, uh, globally connected through um, 
offline uh, spaces as well as um, an online platform and to deepen that community. They've recently created an NFT and have a space in the metaverse and have been educating their their audience who are not crypto natives into that, which has been uh, so interesting to, to witness. Um, my client Rosewood Hotels has recently, have recently as in like this week, launched their NFT, um, which again is in, in a kind of educational piece. And we've done that in collaboration with Smart Media Labs, which is part of Smart Media Technologies, which is great. A very consumer friendly uh, uh, NFT. And then there's another one that goes live in about a week um, uh, uh, with an incredible advertising agency that's very a purpose driven campaign. So, so playing around with those things, finishing up at Oxford and looking forward to more projects in the pipeline. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. So, I mean, there's absolutely so many different angles that we can take here, but I'd love it if we could maybe start off on a more broader perspective. And I'm just going to throw this question out here if anyone wants to feel free and, and jump in and comment. But how would you describe the difference in consumer demographics in terms of qualities, buying and purchasing habits between the Web 2 consumer and the Web 3 consumer that we're now seeing emerge? I can do Yeah, go for it. Um, well, I have a few thoughts about this. So, so uh, historically, which means like ten months ago, <laughs> um, in the space, um, you know, a Web three native consumer would be like considered a DGen. You know, the the picture of that audience would be like some twenty three year old hacker type gamer wearing a headset in the basement, you know, like very into that space. Um, and that was, that was primarily who was making up the web three space. Now, I mean, everybody is, is involved or trying to get involved or thinking about getting involved, but doesn't know how. So I actually think that it's not it, the delineation is is a lot less than it has been at any point before. Um, and I think what I what I suggest to brands is to really think about it like, don't think about it like Web three only, Web two only. If you are a Web three native brand and you have a very specific audience, like that's your audience. It's the same exercise for any brand brand product, brand consumer relationship. Where like, don't worry about who your audience is out here, worry about like, who are you trying to reach as your core audience? Because that's what your brand's audience is. Um, and I think what a lot of brands are trying to do now is either the more web two traditional brands, they're trying to capture a web three, web three audience um, that isn't appropriate for them and their brand and isn't their core audience, but they're trying to just like hit the trend of like, well, we need them. And there's a disconnect or they're not seeing traction. Um, other, other things like Web3 native brands, their audience might actually be, you know, people who are just now entering the space. So it's really a bigger conversation and exercise that I think all brands really need to like dive into before they even decide what they want to do within Web3. Because even, you know, there are so many different ways to engage in Web3, and now there are so many different audiences to engage. So it's it's the whole process. Definitely. Sean, Noel, I'm wondering if you have any comments that you wanted to add on to that? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think Rebecca made a lot of great points. Um, there's no sort of overarching um, blanket statement for all these people, right? I think if you look within Web3, um, you have crypto native. And then you have the incumbents, the crypto native people, you know, they tend to be your, your cypherpunks. They tend to be web first. They're anons, they're, they're non-docs, they're, you know, pseudo anonymous. Um, and then you have the hype cycles that come with it, right? Something happens in the space, you have the innovators, and then it seems like a bunch of people made money in what appeared to be a relatively quick period of time. Then you have all the opportunists, um, and then things trickle down from there. But I think what's really cool with, with NFTs, uh, aside from Web3, is NFTs sort of seem to be like the great equalizer. Um, and I would say the market that's attracted NFTs from the non-crypto native community is the early sort of trend spotters. 
uh, the people that, you know, they tend to be hip to the new trends within, within fashion. They tend to already understand the mindset of collectibles. Maybe they collect sneakers. Maybe they have figurines. Maybe they, um, you know, they have watches, sneakers. They collect uh, up-and-coming artists. Um, but then I would say as it pertains to brands, um, there really isn't a breakdown. Um, a brand's NFT Web3 strategy should be to attract the segment that already exists within them. And, you know, I found, especially from uh, my security token days, that people think just because you accept crypto or just because you have a blockchain element, all of a sudden you're unlocking yourself to this whole new world of crypto rich investors. When like, if you're a real estate platform and you're doing tokenization, at the end of the day, you're still selling real estate. So whatever your strategy is as a brand, right? Um, whether, and if, you're, if your strategy as a brand is to attract, attract crypto native people, then there's certainly steps you can do um, there's plays around DeFi, there's different tokens you can follow, there's different uh, crypto native artists you can follow. But if your step, if your, if your strategy as a brand is to reward your most loyal people or to create like a clubhouse effect um, or to drive a certain action, then really the, the blockchain element should be pushed to the background and all you should be really doing is aligning incentives and just leveraging this new medium, which is a web first pl uh, platform to go out and sort of execute on whatever your end goal is. And that's what I often tell people who are on crypto native. Let's start with what your goal and priorities are. And then we can work backwards to plug in the inputs to help get you there. Definitely. And uh, Noel, did you want to add anything on to that? Yeah, definitely. I'd love to build on just some of the good things that have been said. So um, I guess the first, um, uh, uh, like kind of just pause on what Sean said. So same thing, if it's uh, if the brand's audience is non crypto native, we first say like, what are your goals with this campaign? Is it awareness, is it engagement? All right, then how can we look at a smart contract or an NFT in particular and in supporting that goal? And like, what kind of utility can we layer in? And, you know, what kind of other mechanics do you have behind this, like paid media to make sure that, um, you know, it's reaching your audience and, and what other um, kind of like building blocks you need to put in to make sure it's getting adopted from your audience if they're not crypto native. Um, the other thing I would say is that I also similarly see that the, it's like, the person who's leaning into um, the, this space first is that early adopter, right? I feel like it's that like five to 10% um, of like maybe any, I mean, that's just a general, like generality, but like any given population who's like, yes, I will first try this. Yes, I will do that. Yes, I will put my credit card on the internet and it won't get stolen. You know, it's like, it's, it's that person in that mindset that I've seen um, like uh, adopting this space first. Definitely. Thank you for that. And so something that I'd love to dive into is the shift in the nature of the relationship between buyer and the brand or the consumer and the brand as we move from a centralized model to a decentralized model and maybe talking about how that message to receiver dynamic has become much more two dimensional where, you know, the, the consumer has much more power of say and messaging. And maybe if any of you guys wanted to comment a little bit about that shift and what we can anticipate to see as it develops out further. Yeah, that's actually um, a great point. So I'll, tr I'll try to give my concise version of this because I've, I've gone into great greater detail around it. So I think um, what's happening with, with NFTs is probably like the greatest innovation to happen for the brand consumer dynamics since the invention of social media. And prior to that, it was probably like, running ads on television, right? So television ads allowed you to hit a super broad base of people and get your messaging across. Social media uh, changed the way that brands and consumers are able to communicate. You're actually able to have a dialogue with a brand and express things. But what social media created was also the opportunity for other brands uh, to redirect target you. And as a result, uh, the millennial generation and the consumer became very fickle and there was no brand loyalty and it became very quick and easy to switch. I think what NFTs when executed correctly are able to do is actually align the long-term um, incentives um, and values 
and actually reward um, your top your top fans. Um, and I think what you're going to see after NFTs, especially with influencers and brands, are social tokens, uh, which will help further align participation incentives um, as a way of achieving NFTs. Like long term, I don't think we'll see at least with consumers and brands, um, people like whipping out credit cards or spending their own ETH to purchase an NFT. It'll be purely towards reward and participation and this internal token that comes from without having to spend dollars, but having to spend time. Yeah, great point. Yeah. And Rebecca, Noel, I'm wondering how you guys imagine the shift to affect the landscape moving forwards. Yeah, I... Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I am a brand nerd and I get really excited about like the shifts that have happened over time. So I think it's important to kind of like just give a brief overview that for, for so many years, like, you know, 200 years, it was brand name consumer. They put out a product, we buy it. And you can decide which toothpaste you're buying, but it's going to be one of the ones that are out there. And that's just what how the relationship works. Um, and then not that long ago, I'd say I, I really think Casper was one of the first brands to like really shake things up. But like the whole startup movement, you know, within the last decade, really, I mean, we're not even looking earlier than that, started to shake all of these big corporate brands up. And they were like, oh, we, we need to be more innovative. We need to offer more because now our bottom line is impacted. And so we saw this rush around 2016, 17, 18 of all of these corporate brands creating corporate innovation labs and being like, we're your startup. And I know this because I, I worked <laughs> and led some of them. And like they were trying to be a startup. What does that mean? It means, oh, we understand our audience and we are offering them something different. We're not that corporate brand. And so I think this it's really interesting that this is happening so quickly after that last shift, um, because now those corporate brands, traditional brands are having to rethink again how that consumer relationship is going to be. And to Sean's point, like it's all about the audience and the consumer, you know, like now it, it's no longer leaning towards the brand to be like, oh, we just put out new products. It's like, no, you have to put out a product that me as the consumer is interested in. And what that looks like in an NFT capacity is, well, what's the community? What is that offer? What do I get long term in terms of like incentives? Is there a token? Like every time I use your like it, it switched power roles. Right. Like if I want to use your toothpaste and we're not there yet with <laughs> NFTs, but like, you know, if I want to use your toothpaste, what do I get besides just using your toothpaste? And I think that's really the larger conversation around what NFTs can unlock in that relationship. But what we see is like a definite power shift. The consumer is now in the seat to decide how that how that might flow. And if the brand doesn't step up we're going to go to someone else. Right. And that that's an amazing point about that shift from product more towards messaging. It's almost equally as much about what does this brand represent in terms of identity as it is what they're selling. So Noel, I'm wondering if you had anything that you wanted to contribute to that as well. Um, yeah, I would, I would contribute that it's, it's, it's community, right? So um, like just building on what Rebecca said, um, it is now the consumer that has more control. And then how are you like really authentically, which is an overused word historically, like how are you really authentically engaging them? You can't really fake it anymore. You know, you can't really fake it in Discord. Um, and uh, uh, I run social teams, um, have done for the last almost seven years now. And um, there is an added layer of um, engagement and time and authenticity. There's great reward, right? And I feel like the, the conversations that you can build um, through your social communities on, with, with Web3 uh, communities, whether it be Twitter spaces or your Discord or, or Telegram, whatever it is that is your medium, like they're, they're really, um, they're, they have a lot of power, yeah? Um, and so I think we're just seeing the beginning of that um, which is really exciting and um, seeing how uh, uh, 
that can really make impact for brands because it's been really noisy um, and there's been a lot of inauthentic inauthentic behavior right and and in the web too so i think that's what's getting the people around me really excited um i think that on the social influencer side if you talk about the web two ones they're still figuring it out um uh very much so and i think like on what sean said social tokens i think that is just the beginning i think that like uh, the relationship um, between maybe influencer and, and audience hasn't even started yet. And I think social tokens is like really going to change all that. And you're going to have the consumers be more in control and what we can build together is going to be super exciting. Um, and, and, and yeah, on the engagement piece, which we talked about for just a moment there, I think that the way that brands um, can deepen the engagement through loyalty and membership and utility through NFTs with their customers going to be super exciting. Yeah. Definitely. And I'm really excited to see that social fi space kind of build out in the future. Um, so in all of your intros, I believe you guys mentioned having worked with both traditional brands entering, you know, the Web3 space compared to Web3 brands who, you know, are coming in um, with these communities and, and engaging with them from the bat. And I wanted to kind of pick your brains a little bit on the difference between the two. And if you think that one has an advantage over the other, being the first to the space and coming on and helping develop it, or having that existing audience from the web two side of things and trying to transition over to that new web three demographic. So if anyone wanted to jump in here. Happy to happy to jump in here. Um, so I think with, with all these things with web two to web three transition, um, especially as if you're native to one side versus the other, there's always sort of a crawl, walk, run sort of strategy here, right? And um, I think it's, it's, it's hard to deny that you're not going to see both happen concurrently. And it just matters who the target audience is, right? So I think obviously for the metaverse to take off um, and for brands to stay relevant, they're going to need to, existing brands, they're going to need to have integrations within whatever the hot thing is today, right? And you, you've already seen it with uh, the central land and sandbox, there's, you know, fashion islands and shows, brands are creating presences within it. Um, we're looking at a bunch of companies right now that are creating uh, metaverse, virtual sort of e-commerce, virtual showrooms, virtual shopping experiences, which we have a very strong thesis around as well as a fund. Um, and then I think you, you can also see though that inherently there will also be web three native brands that are gonna be super popular as well that are going to be more fitting for the web three native community of cypherpunks that don't care about Chanel, Saint Laurent, that don't even care about uh, Supreme or you know one of them or, or Nike for that matter. And I think, you know, Artifact, uh, was a was a good example of a Web three native brand. Obviously, it's owned by Nike now, um, but you're gonna you're gonna start seeing a bunch more. I think Shop Runner is the other platform that's taking like a fashion forward approach to sort of creating Web three native stuff. And I think again to to really merge those worlds, if that is your goal as a Web two native brand, um, collaboration is key, right? If you know. Gucci, instead of doing a collaboration with North Face or with Kith, um, is doing a collaboration with a Web3 native brand or a NFT established artist as a way to, you know, pay homage to this new market that they're going after is all super effective strategies. Um, and I think we're going to start seeing, you know, if you look at the younger generations on Roblox, right, like the e-commerce aspect there, the way these young kids are decorating themselves, their homes, their, you know, little mini mansions. It's all so impressive that uh, it's going to be sort of undeniable uh, to see what the possibilities are. And the question comes, right, is it going to be some sort of uh, one to one copy, right? You buy a jacket in the store, you get an NFT, you can wear it in the metaverse, or a brand's going to get super innovative with it and get really futuristic. Um, I think time will only tell. I think we'll see all of it. Um, or maybe, you know, there'll be a, a metaverse world where 
fashion and branding is inherently not meant to exist. And we're all meant to walk on a similar level playing field. Um, there'll be opportunities across, across all, um, in my opinion, and look forward to watching the progress. Definitely. And I think there's a lot of really interesting and creative ways that brands are able to engage with Web3 and NFTs. And Rebecca and Noel, I'm wondering if there are any particular examples that come to mind or projects that you're working on, even whether it be a traditional brand or a Web3 native brand uh, that have just utilized the space really creatively or, or in a way that you think has a lot of potential to be used again. Hmm. So many examples. Um, but I did just want to first piggyback off of what Sean said, because I really think that that Web 2, Web 3 collab is the sweet spot right now. I think it's a sweet, sweet spot in terms of um, like strategic partnerships and collaboration. And I think it's also the sweet spot in terms of like how to go into the new audience for a Web 2 brand and for Web 3 brands to even maybe engage with a web two brand that they never have before. Um, it always, well, anytime you're widening the audience pool, I think it's, it's a smart move. Um, what I, you know, I think what brands need to remember is that, and this, I, I, I think they're in, in another um, panel we did before I mentioned this, but the way I look at what's happening in the web three space is kind of like, like if you take Stranger Things, the show, there's the whole world that we live in and we, we buy things and we go to the store and we engage with brands and it lives over here and it's everything we've been doing. And then Web3 is kind of like, what's the world behind the wall? So anything, it doesn't necessarily take away from any of the brand engagements that are happening over here, still do a pop-up do experiential marketing, do out of home, you know, like keep doing all the things you're doing. But now this whole new world, like, and many digital worlds within that world is now open. So it's kind of like, what can you do in this world that maybe you can't do in this world? And I think brands need to start thinking very creatively and, and they're, they're starting to, and they're, asking for help and they're working with people who maybe have more, more experience in the space. But I think it's a really great opportunity to like do something that's different. Cause here's where I think brands might, might have a misstep is if they're just doing the exact same thing. So if you're a bank, I know, I know Tali, you asked like what's working and I'm giving you an example of what I think doesn't work. <laughs> but if you're a bank, and you want to open a bank in the metaverse, well, what else is happening there? Like, is it just a bank? Because you have to think like, do people want that? Is it a bank that like behind the door is like a concert, you know, and there's some kind of collab and blah, blah, blah. Or is it literally a bank, <laughs> you know? So I think, I think that like level of creativity and really understanding like, what is happening over here and why, what do I want to do here that I can't do here? And what do I not want to do here that I can do here? And I think that kind of thinking will be really helpful for brands as they navigate the new space. Definitely. And Noel, what are your thoughts? What have you seen that's worked that hasn't worked? Yeah. I mean, I think the most, my, I can contribute best on particularly luxury brands um, and how they're thinking since that's sort of mostly my, my wheelhouse. And I think um, an example that I love, um, Sean was saying the one of ones, I think that's something that I'm seeing the luxury, particularly fashion brands and design interior and designers. Um, uh, Cause they seem to be the first adopters here. They get their arms around They're like, okay, this makes sense to me. So I sell the physical good. And then there's an NFT with it, which may or may not exist in and said person's mansion in the metaverse but i think that's something that they 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 really understand and jw anderson who's a designer here in london he um did a fantastic uh launch last september where and i'm going to compare him as well to selfridges something they did recently did where the item you purchase the item and then you get the nft and the nft of that can augment over time because one thing I see a lot with my clients, whether they be in hospitality, design, fashion, uh, even consumer, my, all my elevated clients are thinking sustainable first, right? So they're thinking about like, okay, so what chain are we on where it's going to have zero or the lowest impact? And then how can I um, 
communicate that that value to my customers that we we think um both of a sustainable mindset so i'm seeing my clients think about okay well if they buy this can can the nft augment can it change over time instead of buying a new something it augments and then what does that look like for us um commercially and actually selfridges recently did something um a friend of mine helped with uh, Suffrage's Universe. They did it in partnership with Paco Rabanne. Um, and um, the, the activation was um, uh, in support of Paco Rabanne helping him to restore some of his um, collection from the 1960s. And so you buy the NFT and it correlates with the textile from his archives from the 60s. And as they restore it over time, so augments your NFT. And that's just like going back to the engagement piece we were talking about, something that's very interesting. Now, with the Paco Rabanne NFT, there's all sorts of other utility. You get um, access to the atelier in Paris. You get invites to the fashion show. There's all these other um, kind of uh, ways where they've really applied best practices. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm seeing, sort of the noise within my uh, uh, luxury clients where they're, they're, they're looking. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. And so I'd love to switch gears here a little bit because we are wrapping up in about 15 minutes. But how do you guys imagine the e-commerce experience shifting as it enters into the metaverse? And what could we potentially imagine that looking like? if anyone has anything to comment or just the metaverse more generally and how brands can engage with it and, and utilize this new technology. Yeah. So as I kind of mentioned uh, in the last panel um, as a fund, we've been taking a, a deep focus into how e-commerce is going to look and feel in, let's just call it the future. Um, and I think, you know, what's important to like mention with, with web three um, is especially with the metaverse, uh, the possibilities are obviously endless. Um, I was talking to a company, Every Realm, uh, who's focused on metaverse land alone. And they, to my surprise, they said they have looked at over 126 different metaverses already that are fully live and functional. They own like plots of land in almost 30, uh, which means there's probably a pipeline of 300 more metaverses right now that are probably going to deploy by this time next year. Um, and you just look at America alone, right? Fashion and the way New York looks, feels and operates is different than California. Things in LA are different than where I grew up in Silicon Valley and you know, and cross middle America. So there's gonna be an endless, endless uh, selection of things to do for different people that can all look and feel different way. And hopefully people will find a metaverse that fits their personality, their values and their norms. Um, but I will say one thing, uh, the way meta the way e-commerce will look in the metaverse is not like what most traditional metaverses look today. Uh, Gucci will not be putting out any products, either will Gap for that matter, that are pixelated and look like they do in Roblox. Um, so I think, you know, what's, what's happening right now with like Unreal Engine 5 and being able to create ultra real looking experiences um, is, is going to be key. And then the, the biggest challenge with the ultra realistic uh, 3D generative technology is can it be mobile native? Today, it's a bit tough. There's people that are doing it well. I think once 5G comes out, uh, it, it won't be an issue whatsoever. And then it's going to be like, what can you do next? Um, so there's a couple companies we looked at that are doing this really, really well. Um, you go into this showroom and you're having an, you're having a shopping experience just like you would at any other store, except without having to be in the store, which, you know, uh, some people, I think there's nothing to be said about being able to try on stuff, but then sometimes going to a mall and going into store can be a nuisance to put it mildly. Um, not that malls in America are that crowded anymore, but, um, the e-commerce experience, again, it's going to be a crawl, walk, run, run model. Uh, in the immediate term, it's just going to look and feel like a proper shopping experience. I think the question is going to come down to is, does it translate into VR or AR? Um, and more importantly, how is the e-commerce experience going to leverage, or not the e-commerce experience, but how 
are brands going to leverage technology to drive people back to physical stores? Um, and that's something we're also super excited about. Yeah, super interesting. I know personally, I would love to see that AR enhanced experience build out because it really does bridge the gap between, you know, what is physically present and what's possible online. Um, Rebecca Noel, did you want to comment on um, any further on that, on that metaverse e-commerce experience? Sure. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think Sean really, really hit it. But um, one thing, one brand that I thought it was interesting um, a few months back, McDonald's, it, which is not traditionally e-commerce, but I think, you know, like plays around with it, set up an e-commerce option in the metaverse, but then you get the food IRL. And so I thought that that was an interesting way to play in a new space um, for a brand that doesn't really need to do that. Um, and so I think it'll be really interesting to see like, you know, traditional e-commerce brands, how they'll show up in this space and how they might have to evolve. And then you see these other brands that, you know, like McDonald's, which are not traditionally e-commerce also, you know, carving out a little spot in the world. And uh, so I think it'll be really interesting. Right. And I remember Domino's did something similar in Decentraland, I think, where you could order a pizza online. So it, I think it just adds a nice creative exploratory feel to just that that purchasing experience. Noelle, is there anything that you wanted to add to that? Yeah, which is essentially, I, I feel like brands, they're going to advertise. That's like the first thing that they're they're looking to do in this space, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then they might be then tying that back to their e-commerce. Um, uh, what I think will be interesting, I don't have an answer here, but like between all the different metaverses that exist and that are upcoming, like Sean was mentioning, how is your wallet going to behave between that and your tokens and your, your, your different currencies? That's for me, I think is going to be really interesting to, to watch unfold. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And if we're being real here, do you think that the main motivation of a brand to enter the metaverse or Web3 is more from just a PR standpoint, just to say, hey, we're doing it, we're cool? Or is it more about what can we actually do and how can we utilize this space to engage our audience? And maybe it's a bit of both, but I'd love to hear your opinions on that. I'd say PR for now for some of the brands that aren't native, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. But I think for, for, for many brands, um, it's just so clunky for their audience. Um, the UX, that it's probably more of a, um, a, a, a PR exercise at the moment. Yeah. And I think the benefit of that is that PR will gain exposure and allow or introduce new people to come on board and then utilize that space and then come on board and be the inventors and the creators. So is there anything you guys are really hoping to see, maybe some potential that you think is untapped within the space that you'd like to see more brands um, utilizing? Well, I, I want to talk about IP for a second because of my IP degree. I think that intellectual property rights have been really a very big part of why nfts have evolved in the way that they have um you know just to go back a year it was all about art and you know certain nft collections started allowing those that were holding the art to have ip rights and royalty rights and the ability to use the the product however they'd like or to reproduce in commerce it just gave more opportunities than you know i have this painting or i have this NF digital nft um and i think that is something that is very exciting uh within the nft space and i think it's also very empowering for the consumer not only am i buying something and i'm getting access to a community and all these things that the brand has decided, I then can take it and run with it and I can create on my own. And I think that that's going to be really interesting, even as NFTs evolve beyond, um, you know, digital art into audio and other other things. Um, I think it'll be a really big opportunity for intellectual property law and different rights and, and creation around all of that. 
Definitely. I think it's really cool to see the consumer become a part of the brand and, and help it grow. So Sean, Noel, did you want to add anything onto that? Uh, yeah. I mean, I would, I would give two pieces of advice. One to any brand company, even, you know, I spoke to a uh, top 10 layer one protocol uh, not too long ago. If you're building something for NFTs specifically, Metaverse is still years down the line. If you're building something to capture the NFT market today, you can't build it. It moves so quickly. You can't build it for where it's at today, right? If you're trying to build the next PFP project, if you want to replicate the next Board Ape Yacht Club, uh, the lead time for a big company, a big brand, um, especially a non-crypto one, and this was even with crypto one, with the non-crypto crypto one, the amount of red tape and yeses and nos you got to get through, best case scenario, it's going to take you six months to, to launch something, right? In six months, the space is going to look very different. And sorry to disappoint all the people in here. Uh, PFPs will hopefully fade and there will be a new innovation that comes around these 10,000 drops with, you know, a roadmap uh, to utility is, is not going to exist. So don't try to catch the market where it's at unless if you can move in the next two weeks. Um, my second bit of advice to, to brands that I'd like to see them do is don't be so rigid, right? Um, I think one thing you notice with the shift in web two even, right? With, with uh, Wix, within the world of Wix and drag and click and no code sort of website building, uh, within Roblox too, you have this whole ecosystem, the app store alone within your iPhone, which is, you know, what turned the phone into a must have product from a communication device, right? People want to be able to build their own thing. Creators want to create. And when creators are creating, um, consumers will consume um, at a faster rate, right? So going back to the IP discussion, like let people figure out a way to let people build products for you right? Use your labeling, use your tools, use pieces that you've created and just lay that foundation and watch yourself be amused and impressed. Um, you know, nobody knew when the early days of web one that Facebook and YouTube and us sitting in this virtual chat room talking from all over the world is going to exist. Uh, no one knew when the App Store came out that it was going to lead to Instagram and all these other applications that were built on top of it. So brands, like, allow yourselves to have some fun and uh, let people build for you. Definitely. I love that. And uh, so we are running out of time here. Just as a little fun kind of exercise, I asked a poll to the audience of who they predict will come out on top between NFT native brands and traditional brands. And... <laughs> We mostly got NFT native brands, um, assuming, knowing that we have a lot of NFT enthusiasts here, um, not surprising, but it was about 70 to 30% in the poll. And just as we finish up, um, if there were any closing thoughts that any of you guys wanted to add, um, I encourage you all to drop your contact to connect with all of the um, audience members in the chat on the side. But yeah, if there's one last thought or piece of advice that you wanted to give out before closing up, um, starting with Rebecca. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think my advice would be, it's not like, it's not enough to just like, if you build it, they will come like, you should build it with community in mind, uh, especially NFT collections. I think there was a lot early on of uh, disappointed people who were building collections and thought that they were going to have people level um, <laughs> experience and they didn't because at the end of the day it's still you know it's basic economics right like it's is someone interested in what you what you are selling and so I think with whatever you're building if you're building an NFT collection even if you're a brand figure out who your community is your audience do that exercise up front and then you'll have more success definitely thank you and Noel, did you have any closing thoughts yeah, I, mean, I think let have your audience build. I think Sean's spot on, and there's a, a bigger project that I'm I'm working on, and what our fund is looking to do is exactly that. How can we incentivize people to help build for us? Right, that's what it should. In my opinion, that's what it's about. That's what it should be, um, and that's how you're going to get the network effects and and optimizing the technology. Yeah. 
Great, thank you. Sean, if you wanted to close it off. Follow me on Twitter. I have like four real life people that follow me. I've been tweeting a lot lately, mostly predictions and random market trends. So follow me on Twitter. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This has been an amazing chat to everyone in our audience. We'll be back in a few short minutes with the next panel, which is NFT 2.0, the next generation of NFTs. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Rebecca, Sean, and Noel for joining. It's been a pleasure today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tali.